Are we alone in the universe? Or, given the vast numbers of stars and planets, is the universe teeming with intelligent life? The search is intensifying. And what if that electrifying first contact comes? How would it impact human society? religion. I'd like to believe in a creator God. So would such a God make the universe to bring forth innumerable species of intelligent life? Or make human beings on this ordinary planet Earth to be absolutely and utterly unique? Some religions teach that what God does right here is supremely and stunningly special. Religions cannot duck this question. Would intelligent aliens undermine God? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I begin at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., with Stephen Dick, NASA's chief historian. The human obsession of imagining life beyond Earth is not new. This history, I suspect, is important, and Stephen's an expert. Well, the history of the extraterrestrial life debate uh, encompasses more than two millennia you can go all the way back to the ancient Greeks in the 4th century BC, where you had the cosmology of the ancient atomists, who believed that there were an infinite number of worlds, that our world was finite, but that there were an infinite number of atoms in the world, and therefore there must be an infinite number of worlds, some of which were inhabited and some of which were not. That atomist cosmology was not passed uh, on to the uh, Middle Ages. Rather, it was the opposing worldview of Aristotle, Aristotle believed that there was only a single world, and by world he meant cosmos, an ordered system, which is what cosmos means, composed of the planets that we can see all the way out to the sphere of the fixed stars. And that was the view that got passed to the Middle Ages and was in, in, inculcated with the Christian church view. That's right. In the Middle Ages, the big thing was to reconcile this belief of Aristotle in a single world with the omnipotence of God, because if you had only a single world, the question immediately arises, well, cannot God create more than one world? And they answered that, yes, God could create more than one world if he wanted to, but actually he didn't, so that there was not more than one world. Then you have the problem of the incarnation. That's right. If you have the salvation of humans on the earth, does Christ by dying on the earth save people on the other planets? And if the answer to that is no, then you have the scenario of a planet-hopping savior, which was not uh, kindly looked upon, let's say, uh, by those in the Middle Ages. That Christ has to live and die on all these different planets and, in a sense, die all over again when the Scripture says this one is supposed to happen once. And, the, and then the third alternative is that there's another mechanism on other planets, and that's pretty disturbing, too. That's right. Now, I would argue that uh, we should have something like um, that, what I call a cosmotheology. Cosmotheology just means that we need to take into account what we know about the universe, including whether or not there are extraterrestrials. What do we know about the universe? Well, we already know that we are not physically at the center of the universe. Uh, it's possible that we're not biologically at the center of the universe. That's the extraterrestrial life question. If we're not at the center of the universe in a biological sense, that means that uh, we are most likely not at the top of the great chain of being, of all of these beings. You know, on, on the Earth, we seem to be at the top uh, through by evolution by natural selection. But if you take the whole universe or even the galaxy into account, and there are extraterrestrials out there, most likely we are not uh, at the top of that great chain of being. Because I, I hope it's not a food chain. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I don't think so. But. Uh, Stephen's cosmotheology, which would be energized by extraterrestrial intelligences, 
is hardly theology in any traditional sense. God is nowhere to be found, nor are humans very much important. I'd be thrilled to know such new truth, though deeply disappointed that God were no more. I hear of a physicist in London whose belief in the traditional God would not at all be shaken by the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence. Russell Stannard, who has won awards for the popularization of science, focuses on science and religion. There must be teeming, teeming numbers of Earth-like planets out there capable of supporting life. And I, I, I take it as almost axiomatic that ET is out there, a whole variety of different kinds of ET. I, I, I just find a very fascinating thought as, as to what their relationship to God is. If I were to meet ET, my first question would be, you know, what, what's your take on God? You know? <laughs> and um, it, it does raise an interesting question as to how Jesus relates to them. You know, we look upon Jesus as being our saviour, if, if, if you're Christian. But then again, one has to bear in mind that the actual belief is that there is the eternal Son of God who took on human form as Jesus for, for us. So it becomes an interesting question as to whether the same eternal Son of God then takes on the form of E.T. to, to act as their saviour. Does E.T. require a saviour? Well, once you go there, the argument would be that this sort of has Jesus, or the God who became incarnate as Jesus, uh, kind of doing planet hopping and uh, spending his time on millions of places, just uh, kind of living and dying and going through the same process all, all, all over again. It, uh, it sort of subjects it to some kind of mocking. So, so some people don't like that. I, I, I myself don't, don't see any objection to it, you know. If we're happy to go <laughs> hopping around to other countries and things like that to sample other you know, cultures, I, I don't see there's any problem there. I, I think the more, the more in, in, interesting question, you, know, you mentioned intelligent ET. Now that raises the question is, is ET more intelligent than us? And if so, does God value them more than us? You know, ET might look down on us as being very primitive, just as we look down on apes as, as rather primitive and slugs as even more primitive. Well, you know, perhaps E.T. looks down on us. So then the question becomes, okay, does God pay more attention to them than to us? That's one question. And another question is, are they more capable with their superior intelligence? Does that mean they have a better understanding of God? The fact that a person is highly intelligent doesn't mean to say they're highly spiritual. In fact, you no know, one knows of very intelligent people who are spiritual pygmies or people who've got low IQ who are deeply religious and, and have a deep spiritual life. The, the true measure of, of spirituality is how close and how real is, is your relationship with God, with the ultimate. And, and God is the only judge of that. Russell's firm belief in God embraces, not fears, extraterrestrial intelligences. He would welcome E.T., seeing in them novel vistas for understanding God. I respect Russell's conviction, but wonder whether scientists who are firm adherents to particular religions can be biased. That's why I visit Paul Davies, a cosmologist who offers the fascinating idea that the universe must be about something. Could a cosmos filled with extraterrestrial intelligences be what the universe is about? 400 years ago, Bruno was burnt at the stake for espousing the idea that there's a plurality of inhabited worlds. The church thought this was a dangerous doctrine, and I think the church got it exactly wrong. If it is the case, if the emergence of life and mind are part of the great outworking of the laws of the universe, then we would expect to find that life is widespread. So I see searching for life elsewhere as a test 
of the idea that life is not just some sort of irrelevant, meaningless uh, side issue, but is integral to the whole great cosmic thing. I want to take you a million years in the future, a billion years in the future, and there are only two possibilities at that point. Either we have discovered some form of life or intelligent life in the universe, or we've not. For either case, what kinds of conclusions would that help you toward? I think if we find intelligent life elsewhere, it raises very serious issues uh, for the Christian religion, though not for the other world religions. And, and it's a sort of mischievous argument, but it goes something like this. The Christians believe that God became incarnate through the person of Jesus Christ, and that uh, Jesus Christ died to save, he was the savior, to save what? Not the dolphins, not the great apes, however noble and worthy these uh, creatures may be, but to save humankind. So God took on human flesh to save humankind. Now that may work in a terrestrial context, but now let's look at the great extraterrestrial thing. Maybe there are intelligent beings out there who've been around for a lot longer than us. They're going to be beings who are scientifically way ahead, they're going to be uh, technologically way ahead, but I submit would also be spiritually way ahead. They would have learned a thing or two in their million or few million years of, uh, of uh, social evolution, and they would surely have uh, figured out how to lead very good lives. By our standards, they would be saintly beings. Now, are these beings not to be saved? It seems like you have two choices. One is that if the little green men, the proverbial little green men are to be saved, then God would have to take on little green flesh. In other words, the incarnation would be repeated around the universe, maybe an infinite number of times, which seems, again, sort of ridiculous, doesn't it? Uh, a, a, a sort of a bit of a showman act. And I don't think many uh, Christians like that idea. Uh, the alternative is that somehow we're the only ones to be saved, which would make me feel uncomfortable. You know, what's so special about Homo sapiens that, uh, that we get to be saved and all these saintly beings out there don't? There's another point of view, which is that um, we have to spread the word to them and convert them. But, you know, that that's pretty ridiculous too, or that they could be saved by some other mechanism than an incarnation. You know, my, my own point of view is that uh, these are not issues for me, but when I put these uh, ideas to my uh, Christian theologian friends, well, they get tied up in all sorts of knots. So uh, I regard this as a challenge to Christianity, less of a challenge to the other religions. Now let, let's do the opposite. And we're a million, a billion years in the future and there is not a scintilla of evidence of life anywhere else. Well, it's true that uh, the great world religions, because they're so much tied to life on Earth and our species in particular, uh, would, would not be much troubled uh, if it uh, turned out that we were alone in the universe. Uh, they would probably feel, well, then there's no threat uh, to their doctrine from any of these uh, difficult issues concerning advanced intelligent aliens who are like saintly beings. But if you want to believe that life originated by a natural process, you would have to concede that this process was so stupendously rare that it's happened only once and then that does make us look like freaks. One of the things that I have found rather surprising and a bit depressing is that theologians have given very little thought to this extraterrestrial dimension. They really don't want to think about it, it makes them feel uncomfortable. To Paul, extraterrestrial intelligence is central to his vision of a universe in which life and mind are an integral, meaningful part, and that such expanding conscious awareness is in some way responsible for having brought the universe into existence in the first place. As for Western religions, Paul's convinced that E.T. would undermine them all. Robin Collins, a young Christian philosopher, disagrees. Robin's a leader among modern theists in discerning God's design, and he's ready to include extraterrestrials. Robin, as a theist, are you in favor of searching for other intelligent life in the universe? Yes, I am. My theism itself inclines me to think, though I can't be sure, that we're not alone. Because I think God is infinitely creative, and if God wants embodied intelligent life 
like ourselves, then even more such beings would even be better. This is a different kind of theism than most people have had historically. Yes. What it does is it takes away even more of the so-called specialness and uniqueness of human beings, should we find other life forms. Well, um, we're not special in the sense if we found other life forms in being um, unique, the only intelligent life form, but traditionally the, um, theology hasn't thought that anyhow. They've, they've also populated the world with, for example, angels who are other intelligent life forms. So it's just more intelligent life forms that are embodied is the only difference. And would those life forms have to follow the same, shall we say, salvation process that traditional Christians have followed on this planet? Maybe, maybe not. So we, we wouldn't, wouldn't know if they were fallen, if they had by um, free choice <laughs> turned away from God or something like that, then I think a Christian would probably want to say that there would be some kind of similar salvation scheme for them. But the uh, salvation scheme on earth with God becoming incarnate and Jesus and going through the mm -hmm. process of, of life, death, and resurrection, would that one-time occurrence on earth suffice for the rest of the universe, or would you have to go no, through I that think there would a lot be, of times? Uh, mul probably you would want to say there would be multiple incarnations. Of the same Of the same, same but time. it wouldn't... It, it's going to be pretty busy. Well, that depends on how you think of the um, doctrine of the incarnation. There's two major, there's many views, but two major ones in philosophical theology are one are kenosis, which is the idea that the, the second person, the Trinity, Empty. emptied himself of his divine attributes and became a human being. Under that idea, God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, would be very busy going from, you know, our civilization to the Klingons, the Romulans, or what have you. Yeah, dying and, and getting dying resurrected. Dying and rising. Right. But under another view, it would call, often called the two minds view, what God the Son does is takes a, on a human consciousness and a human body as part of his own consciousness, where there's still this overarching consciousness of God the Son. So it takes up human nature within God the uh, Son. So then... Multiple personalities. And yeah, it's multiple personality by choice. Well, and so what, what, what would happen is then God could have the salvation process going on simultaneously. Yeah, infinite, an, an infinite number of them, as a matter of fact, and would not in any way exhaust the divine being. So it's going to come down to how you think of the question of the Incarnation. As a Christian theist, if you begin to think and admit the possibility of extraterrestrial sentient life that God created mm -hmm. for a purpose, you now have other issues you got to deal with. Right, and, not, and even if you thought, about, you thought there was these other free will beings in totally other realities. So the only way you're going to avoid that issue is think that we were the only free will beings God ever created. Yeah, that's been a view. It's not mine, and it just seems hard for me to conceive of an infinitely creative God just doing it once. Extraterrestrials don't threaten Robin's belief. Indeed, he welcomes them all as evidencing the infinite God, though his position thwarts historical church doctrine. How might salvation work on innumerable worlds? One planet-hopping savior dying and rising innumerable times? Or innumerable saviors incarnating the same Spirit of God? Both, to me, seem, well, a little odd. But there's lots of odd in existence, including us. I should visit scientists who are actually searching for E.T. So to San Francisco I go to meet astronomer Jill Tarter, director of the Center for SETI Research, who personifies the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and psychologist Doug Vakoch, who focuses on the cultural impact of E.T. and how we could communicate with them. If you were to discover intelligent alien life, would that undermine at least the traditional God that we are all 
used to dealing with. Yeah, you know, Robert, I see that question as, as nonsense. All right. If God exists and extraterrestrials exist, God was responsible for them, so how can their existence undermine God? If God doesn't exist, there's still the question, do extraterrestrials exist or not? It's an open question to be asked of the universe and hopefully answered with, with experimental uh, methods. And so I don't see it as being a real question. So, so it, it may not be a real question to you, but I think for some it would be. Often there's the idea that in Christianity there's this notion of somehow being central, that Christ came to earth uh, and that salvation only applies to human beings. But if you look at, at what some theologians have said, that there's a real openness. There's a Christian conservative uh, theologian, very strong believer in biblical creationism. He says, similar to, to Jill's argument, that if in fact there is intelligent life out there, that does nothing to change the relationship between God and humankind in the same way that if a young couple decides to have a second child, it does nothing about their special relationship with their first child. And I think it's important not to conflate the notion of specialness and a sense that there may be other civilizations out there as well. To the extent that we think that we have to be somehow unique we're not going to be threatened by discovering extraterrestrials because there is going to be something inherently unique about us, about our civilization, about our biology. We can't help but be unique in the sense of being idiosyncratic. Well, let's look at the realities that some people, many scientists, would look to the search for extraterrestrials as a weapon to attack what they would believe to be the uh, uh, destructive uh, approach of traditional religion in saying how special we are. Well, actually, I think that uh, this whole idea of having any confidence that a particular discovery might undermine organized religion is, uh, I think we've seen millennia of the counter examples. Organized religion is extraordinarily flexible and over the past thousands of years has been able to adjust itself to accommodate different cosmologies, different knowledge. And I would be very surprised if most organized religion would not be able to uh, embrace the new knowledge that there are other intelligent civilizations in the universe. And I think the real challenge is as we try to anticipate the nature of extraterrestrials, how do we avoid transposing our way of conceptualizing ourselves, our relationship with one another, our religious concerns onto other beings? So I think the real challenge um, is for us to be open to extraterrestrials being very different than we are. You know, some have said that uh, if extraterrestrials have a religion of their own, if they're much more advanced than we are, um, it would be very difficult to resist that. I don't buy it because I think that our religions serve human needs for some people. For some people, there's no need for a religion. Whether extraterrestrial intelligence exists has profound implications. There is an ultimate answer. We are either alone or not alone. But theists and atheists will each mold that ultimate answer to fit their opposing worldviews. If we are alone, theists will stress human uniqueness, a special creation. While atheists will mock God for making so barren a universe. If we are not alone, theists will praise God for creating so bountiful a universe, while atheists will ridicule human uniqueness as archaic self-deception. If ET exists, Christianity has issues. How does salvation work? Did Jesus' death and resurrection on earth 
suffice for all beings for all time? But many ET civilizations must predate humanity. Maybe there's another way to salvation. Christians wouldn't like that one. Or maybe ET gets no salvation. Hardly fair, don't you think? Eastern religions, not claiming a personal God, would not be so encumbered. Here's the bottom line. Just asking the question, alone or not alone, is closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.